Today we are um, looking at Hannah, and uh, we're going to look at her life as kind of something that perhaps we can uh, uh, see as our special occasions. My mother always would tell me, well, what did you preach about on Mother's Day? And then she would always go, oh. And I said, no, Mom, what did you want me to say, you know? <laughs> you know, she would always ask me that question, like, uh, and there was a, uh, a, I don't know if it was Jack Hayford or one of those individuals from years ago when she was uh, a young mother, preached a sermon on uh, Mother of Mine, and it's, a, it, it's in a book, and I, I even, when she was here, I spoke on it, but it wasn't any as good as Jack Hayford, you know, so, <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, we always have those uh, memories of Mother's Day or those memories of, of um, what a Mother's Day sermon should be. Uh, I remember one lady uh, said, it was a long time ago, she said, I hate when they do those sermons on Mother's Day. I goes, what? She says, I can't measure up to any of those things that you say. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I'm sorry, you know. So the, the challenge is to present um, that which is important uh, and that which is part of our life, and, and also to challenge us in our, in our lives that we um, uh, are, are wanting to emanate what God has given to us. So, let's look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1, and we're reading through to verse 20 in the Message Bible, and this is about Hannah. There once was a man who lived in Ramathium, he was descended from the old Ziphonite family in the Ephraim Hills. His name was Elkanah. He was connected with the Zuphite families from Ephraim, though through his father Jeroham and his grandfather Elihu and his great-grandfather Tohu. He had two, two wives. The first was Hannah and the second was Penina. Penina had children, Hannah did not. Every year, this man went with, from his hometown up to Shiloh to worship and offer a sacrifice to the God of the angel armies. Eli and his two sons, Hophni and Phininaho, Phininaho uh, served as the priest of God there. When Elkna, Elkanah sacrificed, he passed blessings from the sacrificial meal around to his wife, Peniah, and her children. But he always gave a special, generous helping to Hannah because he loved her so much and because God had not given her children. But her rival wife taunted her cruelly, rubbing it in and never letting her forget that God had not given her children. This went on year after year. Every time she went to the sanctuary of God, she could expect to be taunted. H Hannah was reduced to tears and had no appetite. Her husband, Okana, said, Oh, Hannah, why are you crying? Why aren't you eating? Or, and why are you so upset? Am I, not more worth, or am I not of more worth to you than ten sons? So Hannah ate. The, then she pulled herself together slipped away quietly and entered the sanctuary. The priest Eli was on duty at the entrance of God's temple in the customary seat. Crushed in soul, Hannah prayed to God and cried and cried inconsolably. Then she made a vow. O oh God of the angel armies, if you'll take a good hard look at my pain, if you'll quit neglecting me and go into action for me, by giving me a son, I'll give him completely, unreservedly to you. I'll set him apart for a life of holy discipline. It so happened that as she continued to pray before God, Eli, watching her closely, Hannah was praying in her heart silently. Her lips moved, but no sound was heard. Eli jumped to the conclusion that she was drunk. He approached her and said, You're drunk. How long do you plan to keep this up? Sober up, woman. <laughs> Hannah said, Oh, no, sir, please. I'm a woman of hard use. I haven't been drinking, not a drop of wine or beer. The only thing I've been um, pouring out is my heart, pouring it out to God. Don't for a minute think I'm a bad woman. 
It's because I'm so desperately unhappy and in such pain that I've stayed here so long. Eli answered her, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel give you what you have asked of him. Think well of me and pray for me, she said, and went her way. Then she ate heartily, her face radiant. Up before dawn, they worshipped God and returned home to Ramah. Alkna slept with Hena, his wife, and God began making necessary arrangements in response to what she had asked. And before the year was out, Hena, Hannah excuse me, had conceived and given birth to a son. She named him Samuel, explaining, I ask God for him. So this is a, the story of Hannah, and it was a, a difficult time. A difficult time for her because in the custom of Israel, if you did not have a child, it meant that God had cursed you, basically, and that you were not a good person because you were unable to bear children. And so Hannah was not able to have a child, and um, her husband, that uh, Alkna, had another wife, and you would say, well, whenever they went up to the temple or went up to Shiloh to worship, it was there that she, this, this uh, second wife always badgered her. Well, you would say, well, how can two people live together in the same community and not badger each other? Well, if you know the nomad community, they would have a wife, they would have a tent for each wife. So if whenever we were in Israel, we were, we were driving down the road and there was this guy, he had three tents. And uh, the tour guide said, see that three tents? He has three wives. <laughs> so each of the wives had their own tent. And if you go into the cities, um, they have stories in their, in their houses. And each floor meant a, a different wife. <laughs> so, and then you, if you look at the uh, buildings, they have all of these um, building rods, you know, these uh, reinforcement rods sticking out of the roof. They were waiting for another wife. That's what was going on there. So, yeah. so if you have these pictures of Israel in the Middle East and you, you see there's like two or three story house and it looks incomplete on top in all the houses, almost all of them had, were incomplete because they were waiting for another wife. Um, when we were in um, traveling in um, Petra, we, you know, that the ancient city of Petra, and, you know, it's where everything is carved out of the, uh, out of the stones and stuff, out of the side of the hills, and uh, um, the, the movie Search for the Holy Grail with, um, what's his name? In uh, Lost Ark, you know, what, whatever his name is. Um, he used to, well, anyhow, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that that treasury scene where he goes in and he goes back to get the grail and he has to duck and everybody gets killed. Well, inside that's the that's Petra, and it, it's it's quite a quite a place. But anyhow, it was in these that we were there in that remote area and uh, there was this merchant. I mean, the guy was probably twenty some years old, looked like twenty some years old, and he was selling things there. and And he said, well, he needed to sell us these goods and we needed to buy them because he needed he needed money for his family and and i and i said well well how many how many kids do you have he says well i have five wives <laughs> he's like you have five wives you look like you're 23 years old you have five wives and i don't know how many children and it's like okay what a system so so anyhow alkna here um alkna the husband he had two wives and uh, Penina, the second wife, was always badgering the first one, but only whenever they went to worship because they had two different tents. So they probably didn't have much interaction whenever they weren't going to worship. But whenever they would go to Shiloh, they would go to the temple at Shiloh, and it was there on the trip that Elkna was uh, taking his two wives, and Hannah was berated, belittled, badgered by Penina because she didn't have any children. So all along this trip and every time, every year, they would go up to war. So you can imagine um, that this, would be, this wouldn't be a time to look forward to. Hannah would have to make the trip 
and she would find herself just belittled and badgered by this second wife. Well, even Elkanah, Elkna, the, the, the husband, you know, and, and he read this, and, uh, and I was just inferring, I imagine that some, sometimes women say, you know what, you just don't understand. Any, and I know and any ladies, you ever say that about your husbands? Rhonda, don't raise your hand. That uh, they just don't understand, you know. They haven't got a clue. Well, Elkna, the husband, says, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Yes, she has given me children, but it's you I love. Ignore her taunts, you know. Aren't I better than you than ten? Well, you know, um, you just don't get it, guy. Husband, you just don't get it. So here she is, and she's longing to have a child, and it's many years going through this torment and, as it were, um, torture. But Hannah did not harden her heart. Okay? Because things were going wrong, things didn't happen the way that she wanted them to happen, she didn't harden her heart, nor did she become bitter against the other lady, against the other wife. She was able to keep those things in check and able to keep her, her eyes focused on what she wanted. She wanted a son. She wanted a son from her husband and her to have their own child. And she kept her focus on what she wanted, not on the hardship. And, and I think that that is so important in our lives that we don't become distracted by the hurts and the pains of life, but we can focus on what we want and what we desire. And Hannah, um, she wasn't able to make her husband understand that, that it wasn't, you know, it wasn't that it was his fault, it wasn't that it was her fault, it was just that she wanted to have a son, she wanted to have a child. And so, um, the husband's attempt to comfort her didn't go very far, but we find that when she goes to worship, she has, because she stays focused on what her need is and what her desires is, she also knows that God is the one who gives her hope. This is the challenge for all of us in that no matter what the desires or the problems are, our hope is in God, and we must maintain the correct attitude about ourselves and about the relationships and about what's happening because we need to know that God is our answer and our hope. So when Hannah goes to the temple, whenever she goes there to worship, she's weeping, and she's very upset, she's very distraught, but where does she go with her sorrow? She goes to the temple. She goes to God. And here she is, standing before God. Now, her husband is, is sympathetic, but he doesn't understand. Well, then you, ta- then, you, then you put on top of that, the preacher doesn't even understand. <laughs> yeah. That wouldn't be me. I don't understand everything, you know. Just kidding. (laughs) Um, Even Eli, the priest, misunderstood her, misunderstood the prayer, misunderstood the intention. So here is Hannah, and she's weeping, and she's praying, and her lips are moving, but she's not making a sound. And in in her spirit, she's saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son... Then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. So here she is, crushed in soul, but there's something else going on here. That her desire to have a son also aligned with God's desire to give his nation a prophet. And sometimes we look at our life and we look at our desires and we would say, well, you know, who am I? You know, this isn't that important. This is, God knows the desires of our heart. And whenever we are not allowing ourselves to be crushed because our prayers aren't, aren't answered, we may also recognize that God has a desire to give to us the exact same thing that we desire. And the two of them come together. The two of them come together. And so here is Hannah praying for a child, praying for a son, and also God needs to raise up a prophet 
in the land because Eli, the priest, and his two sons, they're not very good. <laughs> they're, not, they're not good guys. His sons are, are you know, they're just wild, cra- crazy guys. And uh, anyhow, they're going to be punished later on in their life anyhow for all their sins because they, they, they abused their position in the, in the temple. They abused all of that and they abused the laws of God. And anyhow, that's a different story. So the priest Eli, whenever he um, saw this woman praying, now he was used to people coming to the temple and he was used to people kind of, you know, overdoing it. They're off on vacation, they're here to worship and they get consumed with their wine and they're carrying on. And he was used to those types of things. And so watching Hannah from his chair, he assumed that, this lady's drunk. <laughs> she's up there. She's, she's praying and she's drunk. Well, her lips moved, but she was not saying anything. And she was silent in her prayer. God knows our prayers. That we don't always have to say them. That God has a way of understanding our prayers. And they're focused. They're direct. And they're exactly to the need. How is God going to answer? Well, you know, God, I would like to have this and I'd like to have that. And now it's like the the Sears catalog at Christmas. You know, we don't have those anymore. But the wish books and all the things on sale. I want this, I want this, I want this. I hope God gets me one of these. (laughs) So anyhow, God is saying, be specific. So we're specific. She said this. She made her prayer to God. How long? Uh, you know, and, and how long will it be, Lord? And so Eli, the priest, is saying, you know what? This lady's drunk. She needs to get out of the temple, go back home and sober up. Well, one like her in a long time because she was so distraught in her prayers. Now, this is, this is a time in which we cry out to God. Whenever our needs are so great and the problems are so overwhelming, and people don't understand the people. There are, there are, there's a, in this case, there's a husband who doesn't understand her. There's a second wife who constantly torments her and belittles her. And she has no refuge except her tent. So she's in her tent and with whom? Alone. She has no children. Year after year, she continues in this plight. And so it is so severe, she doesn't become bitter and try and plot to kill the other wife and take one of her kids. She focuses on God and cries out, weeps before the Lord in agony of soul and spirit. God, hear my prayer. God, I, this is my prayer. This is my need. God, I want you to answer my prayer. But in the same time, God has a desire to bless her and also bless the nation of Israel with a prophet and the two needs come together and as she pours out her heart God she's she's accused of being drunk and she says I am a woman who is deeply troubled I have not been drinking wine or beer so she kind of reproves Eli you know but doesn't tell him off she respects his position but she lets him know what's going on I'm pouring out my soul to God I'm pouring out my soul to God If there is something in our lives that is so important, is that we take the time to know how we hurt and to pour our soul out to God. Hello? That when we hurt, emotionally, physically, spiritually, when we hurt, take those needs to God. Pour out our soul to God. Don't become angry. Don't become bitter. Don't, you know, blow up and, you know, you know, what is it? Blow up, blow off and something or other. But anyhow, don't do that. <laughs> you know, go to the Lord in prayer that when we feel like we're going to blow up and blow off on somebody, don't do that. Go to the Lord in prayer. Keep the right perspective and pour out your heart to God. And do not take your servant as a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Don't count me wicked. Now, I was um, listening on the radio this morning. 
and uh, they had an interview with Amy Grant. Remember Amy Grant? Some of you know Amy Grant. She is a uh, vocal artist, an artist years ago for, you know, our time period, <laughs> my time period. Uh, but anyhow, she was an artist, and, you know, she was, and, and she had this interview, and I thought it was, I was looking, as I was writing this and thinking about it, I was thinking of it in basically two contexts, in the sense of here we have this lady of uh, 3,000 years ago, uh, less than 3,000, and um, she's pouring out her heart to God. And then I was thinking, God, well, how is that relevant, you know, to us today? Well, here's Amy Grant. She's a recording artist. And she says, I know I have a limited toolkit. (laughs) So here's this lady that is just a fantastic singer. And, you know, she's been a recording artist for 30, 40 years. And uh, she says, I have a limited toolkit. As a mother, she was saying this. I have a limited toolkit. I work full time. I travel constantly. If there was a hurricane, if she was in a group uh, or in a setting with her and her children, she said, if there was a hurricane, somewhere in the middle of it was my child. (laughs) And uh, she said that because of her being an artsy person, she didn't say that, that's my, artsy people. Anybody know artsy people? (laughs) Artsy people have, they operate on a different side of their brain. Anybody know that? If you have people that are artists, you know, they, they, just, they just don't function on the same wavelength. And that's because of their artsy, their creativity, their creativity. Well, she, uh, Amy Grant said that. She said, my creativity and the children's creativity is like I, I wanted them to explore and I wanted them to do this. And she said she told her kids, if you can survive me, you can survive anything. <laughs> okay? And, uh, and this was one of the things she said to her about her mothering, mothering uh, skills, she says, so she would say this to her children, let's make some eye contact, let's tell each other we love us, love each other, and let's see if we can find some clean underwear and see what happens for the day. <laughs> you, know? you know, and I, I was thinking that that's the kind of woman that, that Hannah is. She's just kind of this lady that she's, she, wants, she wants to have a child and she wants to have a child that she can dedicate to God. But she wants to have, you know, she's not this super spiritual person that, you know, the, the earth moves and the booming voices come. All she has to go on is the prophet, the, the priest, who mistakenly says to her, are you drunk? <laughs> and when he, she tells him what's on her heart, he says to her, He blesses her. May God of Israel grant your request. Okay? Here's a guy who accuses her of being drunk. And when he hears the truth, he says, May God bless your request. So, here I am. Here you are. All of you ladies and men. All of you got people. And in your heart, stay focused on your request. What is the request that you would cry out and weep before God? That's your desire. And, you know, we're not coming with a full toolkit. (laughs) You know? And we don't have it all together. But we have hope. And along comes this preacher who is a man of God because God has called me to this place. And God has said, whatever you bind in heaven, bound on earth, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. My prayer is, may the God of Israel grant your request. May the God of Israel grant your request. It's not an earthquake. It's not lightning. It's the cry of your heart going out to God. And the God, God's heart, meet, knowing that there is a need, and the two of you are to coming together. You and God are coming together in this moment 
and hearing the voice of God which says, may God grant your request. Now, Hannah here, it doesn't say that the earth shook. (laughs) She just left the temple with a smile on her face. She went home, back to the tent, back to where her and her husband and the uh, and the antagonist were. She ate her meal, and she had a radiant face. She knew it was going to be okay. And not only was it okay, she had a son, and his name was Samuel. And Samuel was the priest who anointed King Saul. He's the priest, who, who is the prophet, rather, that anointed King David. And he is the prophet that was over Israel for a number of years that directed the nation. And it was her need, God's need, coming together. And year after year, she would return to the... She, she dedicated Samuel. And when he was weaned, whatever age that is, he, she took him to Eli and gave him to God. And Eli raised her child, Samuel, in the, in the, in the temple, in the temple of God. Now... If you and I were going to take our child and leave him with someone, it wouldn't be Eli. <laughs> Look at his two kids. They, they are, you know, they are a mess. But she made a promise. She didn't renege on it. She went on with it. And her son was Samuel. And every year she returned and she brought Samuel new clothes for him to wear. And every year Eli promised or asked God's blessing upon her, and she had many children after that. But you see the importance of where we are at, what our needs are, and to bring our needs before God, and how that God will make a difference in our life. Amen? Um, will you run down and tell them to come up? And I want to I read something else here. This is chapter 2, okay? And this is Hannah. Read, and this is Hannah speaking. I'm bursting out with good news, okay? This is not the lady who's weeping and crying at the altar. This is afterwards. After she has, after she's had received this promise and after she's been in this place of misery for all these years, she says, I'm bursting with good news. I'm walking on air. I thought she said, I'm walking on sunshine, like the song. I'm walking on air. (laughs) I can't breathe. I'm walking on air. I'm laughing at my rivals. Okay, here she goes. I'm walking on I'm walking on air. I'm laughing at my rivals. I'm dancing my salvation. Nothing and no one is holy like God. No rock mountain like our God. Don't dare talk pretentiously, she says. Not a word of boasting ever. For God knows what's going on. He takes the measure of everything that happens. The weapons of the strong are smashed to pieces, while the weak are infused with fresh strength. The well-fed are not are out begging, and the streets are crushed, while the hungry are getting second helpings. The barren woman has a house full of children, while the mother, ma- mother of many is bereft. God brings death and God brings life, brings down to the grave and raises up. God brings poverty, God brings wealth. He lowers, he also lifts up. What is she talking? She's just like, she's got a whole perspective of life that she never had before. Amen, right? (laughs) Is there a little one who can give me an amen on that? (laughs) Lots of little ones. Okay, so we got the picture? Say amen. All right, you know. Help me out a little bit here. All right. So at this time, I want the ladies to come. All the ladies of the church, young and old, very little, very large. (laughs) Come on down, ladies. Large, no. (laughs) Uh, I meant large in age, not large in size. Sorry, ladies. (laughs) 
Well, I have a whole thing I was going to read here, but I won't do that. <laughs> um, what's that? You're running out of air. Running out of air. Yeah. <laughs> you're not getting any flowers, Bob. No, no, you're not getting any flowers, Bob. Uh, uh. So, um, <coughs> a mother's heart is often the harbor of great care and love for children, for others, for one another. And you know, so, ladies, young, hi, hi. <laughs> smiling. Who, me? <laughs> so, but anyhow, I want to say thank you. You know, God has blessed you. God has blessed us by you being here. Okay, all look at me. God has blessed us by you being here. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> yeah. And so we got our little ones running, and that's the best thing going. So... You have before you some flowers. Um, there are gifts to you. You want to make that announcement? <laughs> yeah, you can. What were you saying? You were saying something very nice, wasn't she? That's right. See, that's okay. That's good. Yeah, it's but how cute the baby. But you see how even as young that we notice how cute and babies are and those are the things inside of you that are your mother's heart that someday you will be and it's just part of something very special and that you are very special each of you including this one <laughs> yeah think of it that you know should I live to be old enough to marry have performed the ceremony for her and her husband and all the good things that will happen, all wrapped up in this little package. All the potential that's in a little package. Just gotten a little bigger package right now. <laughs> and then it gets in a real big package, you know. <laughs> I've had enough, I better shut down. But anyhow, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless you. And before you is a flower, it's our gift to you. And Father, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for each of the ladies, each of the children. We just ask your blessing and guidance upon us that the desires of our heart, Lord, we will bring to you. And God, we trust you to make a difference. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs>